So uh, it's my pleasure to start off proceedings after lunch and uh, with this talk by Dr. Mihir Arjun Varkar. I'm going to um, uh, talk a little bit about Dr. Mihir and his background and his current work and then talk uh, a little bit about the, the topic itself, introduce the topic and then hand it over. So uh, Dr. Mihir is uh, an associate professor at the uh, Pune University at, in the Center of Modeling and Simulation. He's done his PhD in computational condensed matter physics. Uh, he likes to say that he's a computational scientist who likes to dabble into things he doesn't understand. But, uh, uh, but I think what he means is that he, he, he subscribes to a pro problem-centric approach and, uh, and has a multidisciplinary research experience. His broad research focus uh, is on the development of statistical and computational methodologies for data intensive science. Uh, currently, he is engaged on a collaborative research uh, initiative in astrostatistics. His uh, research is related to cosmic microwave background, pulsar <coughs> astronomy, and comprehensive sensing of radio astronomy. Now, let me talk a little bit about his talk. Uh, the practice of data intensive science uh, involves three components. Uh, a scientific question whose answer is being sought, available data that is relevant to the question, and a statistical, statistical methodology that uh, hopefully will lead to an answer. Uh, in this talk, uh, which, is, which is titled A Small Boy and a Hammer Case Studies in Data, Incentive, data Intensive Science, uh, uh, Dr. Mihir will talk to us uh, about about this this idea with on the back of a few case studies which illustrate the process of translating a specific scientific question into an appropriate uh, statistical methodology to be able to answer that question. So, so with that introduction, I'll invite uh, Dr. Mihir uh, Arjun Vadkar. Thank you. Sir. Okay, so this, uh, several of my colleagues and collaborators are sitting in the audience so they will probably be laughing secretly about this thing. And in fact, the title began as a joke on what I do, so uh, I, I talk about it. So this talk is about getting hands really dirty with data. This is not big data by any standards, but uh, it does, I'm hoping that, at least this is how it goes for me was an interplay between starting with a scientific question, look at the available data and then decide which methods one wants to use to address those questions as best as possible, hopefully leading to something interesting. Um, before I begin, let me just uh, do a quick advertisement of uh, our academic program, the MTech program in modeling and simulation. The uh, admission process will begin in June uh, with an entrance test. So please spread the word. In fact, I have to thank Abhijat who is sitting here. He is one of the architects of the original program and he has never got enough credit for this program. So, <laughs> Yeah, the, the second version which we floated is part paper, part research. So, the less coursework, more project. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, copy paste. <laughs> okay, so the title originated in these quotes. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with them. Uh, so, so the small boy in question is me, and the hammer is statistics. But then, actually, I'm going to argue that uh, it's not the same hammer which is applied to the uh, to every nail, and uh, hammer should be changed the moment you change the nail. Uh, here is an interesting insight coming from uh, uh, Bradley Efron, who is the inventor of the bootstrap method. He categorized science over the last three centuries uh, in terms of size of the data sets and complexity of the questions. And clearly, uh, he is saying that the kind of science we are trying to do in this century is dominated by large data sets and complex questions. Um, so, <clears throat> this is where we are. 
uh, as Chirag pointed out, uh, this is my view of what, at least what I do as data science is, there is a scientific, scientific question that is to be answered, at least some progress needs to be made. There is available data uh, to relevant to the problem and uh, the, the, the data involves uncertainties and perhaps the best formalism to handle uncertainties is statistics or it has its own place in the world where there are uncertainties. So we will be talking about, when, when I say methodologies, it's uh, statistical methodologies is what I mean. Uh, there might be other uh, things in computer science which I am not aware of but uh, this is what I mean by methodology and hopefully the methodology answers the question or at least uh, gives some directions for further work. Uh, so I will be presenting a few case studies in ASTO statistics because okay, that's a uh, recent word last 20 years or so. Uh, basically use of statistics in answering astronomy and astrophysics uh, questions. Um, so, so the take home message which I uh, myself learned is basically you don't use a method because you know the method. You basically either adopt an appropriate method or you devise a method to answer a question. You, uh, it's not, uh, so, so the point is it's not the same hammer which you apply to every uh, I have prepared this talk for three case studies. I don't know how much I will be able to cover. Let me begin with the uh, first problem that got me into doing astro statistics. Otherwise, despite having a physics background, I never um, somehow got into learning about astronomy and astrophysics. But this is through statistics I uh, got into this thing. So this has to do with uh, Suppose somebody shows you a data set like this thing. So this is a standard XY kind of data set. Let's not go into the physics of it. We'll, we'll talk about it in a moment. The data looks something like this thing. And uh, you can see several things from a purely data kind of perspective. That uh, there seems to be some trend here like this thing. Uh, from a statistical perspective, you can clearly see that there is some variability in the data at any point on the uh, vertical axis. Uh, but then as, as you go to the right, the spread seems to be increasing. So this is what is called, uh, this is a non-constant variance uh, situation as it is called in statistics. There is a, a difficult word for it, it's heteroscedastic. So this, is, this data is heteroscedastic. Uh, on top of it, what is not clear here is that these points are not independent, they are correlated. So this is, this is the nature of this data, just looking at it as a bunch of numbers visualized <coughs> through a plot like this thing. Now the question is, suppose somebody asks you the question, how many peaks do you expect in this, from this data? Clear answer is there is clearly one peak here because you, know, you see a clear trend here and the data envelope is uh, sufficiently well constrained to see the peak. But then the next question comes, uh, I expect a peak around here, I expect another peak around here. Does the data support this kind of uh, model which contains three peaks or two peaks? In fact, this uh, data comes from a, a satellite a mission called Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. And this, this is in particular what's called the power spectrum of, temperature power spectrum of uh, cosmic microwave background uh, radiation fluctuations. So, um, yeah, okay. So the key question that, that we go to is, can we somehow, uh, uh, more towards the methodology, and can we somehow fit the data, come up with a functional form that explains the data, fits the data, without assuming too much of cosmology, without assuming too much of physics. Uh, now, of course, cosmologists have their own models. There is a whole uh, uh, deal of theory behind all these, uh, all, all that we understand about these phenomena. So evidently, they have models for the, this power spectrum. Uh, can we, without resorting to 
these models? Can we look at the data and somehow rank the models or say that this model seems to be good, this model doesn't seem to be good, but make, make the conclusion more uh, quantitative. A and a more concrete question here is, uh, there is some reason, I will explain it. The locations and heights of the peaks have certain relevance in this particular problem. How do we get, find the uncertainties on these things? So, for example, um, looking at a data envelope, uh, you, you might guess that the answer, vertical uncertainty on this peak might be this thing. We will see what, uh, what the answer we get. Uh, and then the second peak and the third peak, which is expected to be there, uh, the uncertainties clearly have to be large. That much we can say by just looking at the data, but can we give a more quantitative something, a quantitative <coughs> answers, which is uh, statistically more precise. So if you start with these kinds of questions, okay, we will see the background for it. Uh, so, uh, I mean everything literally below, uh, everything literally started at this point which is called the Big Bang. And the reason we are here is this Big Bang. Um, this is a kind of pictorial uh, view, so time increases in this direction. This axis represents the spatial uh, extent of the universe. Initially, things the universe began as an extremely hot and extremely dense uh, entity, and space and time, everything, matter, everything began from that point. That is the understanding. It's not like imagining a firecracker exploding in uh, mid air. That's not the. That's the picture that the word Big Bang might uh, uh, bring to your minds, but that's not the case. Everything began there. So, uh, initially things were so fluid and so, so much in uh, flux that it was a soup of uh, photons and baryons, just to put it, uh, to reduce the complexity. And uh, it, it, it was so dense and so energetic that uh, <coughs> nuclei could not form and atoms could not form. Eventually, as the universe expanded, it cooled down and around this point in time, 380 years after the, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe cooled down sufficiently around 3000 Kelvin of temperature or something like that. That's when atoms could form, hydrogen atoms in particular. So this is the point in time when the photons, particles of light and matter stopped interacting with each other and that's when these photons started flying freely through the universe and now some 13 point something billion years have passed since uh, the Big Bang and at this point in time uh, we see these photons uh, in the microwave uh, region so this is the, so 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 this this light that comes to us is called the cosmic microwave background radiation so 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 the data is related to this particular phenomenon. Uh, what, uh, what the astronomers do is to basically sitting on the earth or from a satellite, you look, look at every direction. So it's like radiation is coming, we are sitting at the center of a sphere and radiation is coming to us from all directions. And uh, so this is like a, if you look at the inside of a sphere, then and from the center you are looking at every point, then you could uh, locate every point on the sphere with two directions coordinates. So uh, that is what, so, so you can think of the, uh, the, the radiation as being associated with each direction and uh, coming from a certain piece of physics uh, called black body radiation, you can associate a temperature with uh, radiation. So, they talk about the temperature of radiation coming from a particular direction. So, in principle, if everything could have been done as simply as possible, you basically have all directions and the temperature of this radiation measured at along each direction. Um, okay, so. Now, what is interesting is, on the whole, if you look at, uh, the, on an average, over this sphere, then this radiation more or less looks like it has about the same temperature in every direction. So that's what uh, 
the fancy word for it is that the universe is isotropic, same in every direction. Uh, it is the fluctuations in temperature which contain information about the uh, see. Uh, See, 380,000 years after the Big Bang is as close as we can get to Big Bang. So, these fluctuations is what is supposed to contain information about the early state of the universe when the photon uh, mass, light and mass interaction uh, stopped. Uh, okay. Technically, what one does when one has this kind of sphere situation is to uh, deal with, to invoke a mathematical uh, black magic called spherical harmonics. So, so don't worry about this uh, thing. But this is, in, in some sense, this is like taking a Fourier transform, which I think most people will be familiar with. So, instead of representing a sine wave as a function propagating in time, uh, you look at a sine wave as one single frequency. This is the real time view and the uh, Fourier domain view. So, in some sense, this is something like that. This is also an orthogonal expansion. And uh, just as one talks about the power spectrum of a particular uh, sound tone, one can talk about the power spectrum of uh, this radiation uh, by integrating out over one of the <coughs> angle coordinates. And uh, so, so this, is, this is how one gets the data that I showed earlier. Now, in practice, a lot, many things happen. You know, the satellite is making a sweep around the Earth and looking at various directions. So, the data that one gets is uh, tagged by direction, but also by the time at which it was made. And then you know the location of the satellite at the given time. So, this is what's called the time order data. Turning time order data into an image, like this thing, is, is probably the first step. Um, there are also several confounds in this whole process. What you see at the center here, the red belt, comes from our own uh, galaxy. And uh, the, for example, the dust in the galaxy and uh, energetic electrons, uh, they also emit or scatter in the microwave range. So you get a very bright uh, patch here. So that patch has to be removed. And once you remove that patch, this act of removing, uh, curating the data itself introduces correlations in the uh, across different directions which otherwise would have been independent as far as observations are concerned. So, that's the source of uh, correlations. And in the end you get a map, something like this thing. From this map, using this kind of expansion, you get to this point. So, this is how this data comes about. Uh, the reason why CMB is considered so important is that, uh, okay, okay, let's talk about what this power spectrum means. Uh, basically, lower on the, okay, this particular axis is called the multipole axis, uh, multipole index. So, lower multipoles correspond to bigger angular scales, smaller multipoles correspond uh, the other way around. Smaller multipoles correspond to bigger angular scales and large multipole indices correspond to uh, small angular scales. So, uh, this way one is talking about the structure of the universe at different uh, angular scales. Um, the other thing about this CMB power spectrum is that these peaks are like uh, every sound has a fundamental and harmonics. These peaks are supposed to have come from the density oscillations in this primordial universe and as such these density oscillations are sound like oscillations. Sound propagates by uh, variations in density. Right? So, so these are uh, so these peaks are related to that uh, to, to that physics of acoustic oscillations of the universe in the early times. So the peaks are supposed to be harmonic. And uh, okay, this is all known physics. Or even if I say supposed to be, uh, this is known physics. The only thing I want to bring out is how data analysis can bring out this kind of. Uh, CMB has been a key, key prediction of the Big Bang model and uh, clearly when the first satellite that uh, went up in, in the early 90s, uh, something called Co Cosmic Background Explorer, when its first results came that basically put a Big Bang uh, arena of models in the limelight and all other models were pushed uh, to uh, oblivion more or less. 
it's the earliest glimpse into uh, the uh, uh, into where the universe began now there are also even within the big bang arena of models there are competing models uh, lambda cdm seems to be the winner so far um, all these models so, so but but then there are also competing models so can you based on the data can you differentiate between these models and say that one model is better than the other um, another direct uh, motivation is based on the data can you infer the values of the cosmological parameters so cosmological parameters are parameters in the cosmological models so uh, things like hubble constant and total ma matter content total baryon content, dark matter fraction, percentage of dark energy, so on and so forth. These are parameters from cosmological models. So estimating these parameters is also of interest um, to cosmologists. And I think this has been, uh, okay, th this last comment has been uh, made earlier in earlier talks. Uh, this um, CMB measurements basically um, exploded the amount of data in cosmology and uh, this is when, uh, as this, this this quote says, this is from 2003, this is CMB data represents right of passage for cosmology from speculation to precision science. So this is the reason why CMB is considered so important. Now going to the kind of questions we talked about earlier, what I am going to argue about now, of course, the decisions were made not by me about uh, using a non-parametric method. This was my first uh, piece of work in this area, so I didn't have that kind of insight into statistics or astrophysics for that matter. So, um, so the credit goes to my Carnegie Mellon <coughs> advisors long back. If you don't want to resort to whatever is known from the physics or cosmology of this phenomenon. Then the alternative you are left with is to make as few assumptions as possible. When you say that Big Bang theory is Big Bang model, is the class of models I am going to work with, you are already assuming a lot of physics. If you don't want to assume that, you need and if you want to keep your inferences as purely data based as possible, you need to go to what statisticians call non-parametric methods. Non-parametric methods are often, often times uh, projected as model independent methods. That's a, a, a little, uh, sometimes too much, sometimes it's uh, realistic, but uh, non-parametric methods do rely on lesser assumptions about the data than uh, uh, parametric methods. Non-parametric methods do work better on large data. So CMB, uh, is an example of large data compared to earlier data sets. It's not, uh, regression data set of size 1000 is not really large by today's standards, but uh, compared to what was available, this is a large data set. And it's not uh, working with really small numbers like tens or uh, like that, okay. Uh, Non-parametric methods also, I will, I will talk about this. Uh, Non-parametric methods allow choosing the optimal fit based on the data itself and this goes through a process called smoothing. We will talk about it. And the particular non-parametric method we used also allows uh, making comp uh, probabilistic statements about uncertainties. So uh, using uh, something called confidence sets, everybody has heard about confidence intervals I suppose. So confidence set is a generalization of that. Uh, checking for other kinds of fits to the same data coming from model based uh, analysis or parametric models for example it's possible with this particular approach and this particular approach is in the long run as in uh, when data size becomes larger and larger this approach becomes more and more non-parametric so some statisticians would strictly call it semi-parametric uh, okay Let's talk about this smoothing thing. So this is a, a standard illustration of a regression kind of scenario. Now across the two rows, the data set changes. The data set is the same for these three and 
a different data set is same for these three. Now if you want to, the, the question is, if you want to say that I want a regression function as in, I want to find out what the dependence between y and x is, some, at least some hand waving thing, some approximate thing, what do I do? I can selectively average out the y values vertically. Maybe I can make vertical bins and average out y values in each bin and that gives me an idea about uh, what the uh, value of the true dependence might be at that point. Okay, so for example, suppose I give you a prescription saying that, suppose this is the entire data range, just ignore where you are on the x-axis, just uh, average out all the data values, all the y values, you will get a fit which looks something like this thing. At the other extreme, suppose I uh, say that my prescription is connect every successive point with a straight line. So you will get a fit something like this thing. Now the problem with either ends is that, well, if you look at this end across data realizations, you will see that this flat fit doesn't change much across different data realizations. But on the other hand, you know, visually, the way our brains function, we clearly see there is, that there is a trend here in the data. So you have clearly smoothed the data too much at this end. Although across data sets you are not getting too much variability in your downstream uh, <coughs> analysis, what you get is blatantly wrong. On the other hand, at this end, if you look at, um, uh, if you look at these two, what you will see is that although this kind of prescription is capturing the uh, dependence of y on x in, in, in a better fashion, across two different data realizations, the nature of this curve changes drastically. So at this end, variability is high across data realizations. At that end, variability is low, but you are completely off from the truth. So the way statisticians put it, it is variance which is high at this end, variance is low at that end, bias is low at this end, bias is very high at that end. So what you want is something somewhere in between. So it's an optimal kind of balance between bias and variance. And that is what uh, most non-parametric regression methods uh, try to do. Here is another example of the same phenomenon. This phenomenon shows up in all, all kinds of places. Suppose you, you are given a, a whole pile of numbers and you are asked to plot a histogram. Uh, the standard question is how much bin width should I take? If I take the entire data range as a single bin, then you will get a single nice rectangular box. And any structure, probabilistic structure in the data will be completely lost. So this is the high bias end. But clearly across data sets variability will be low because you are smoothing too much. At the other end, if you take bin size too, too low, then uh, you are probably capturing uh, structure in the data. But on the other hand, uh, across different data sets, your histograms will look extremely different. So the truth is somewhere in between. Or the optimal smoothing is, optimal level of smoothing is somewhere in between. And this is why uh, uh, there are several prescriptions for finding the optimal bin size when you plot a histogram. This is uh, an example of the same phenomenon. Okay, generally, uh, uh, so the squared bias, bias is deviation from the unknown truth and variance is variability across data realizations. So, uh, so the bias typically increases with greater smoothing uh, variance typically decreases with greater smoothing, but then you, you see that there is a crisscrossing behavior. So if you add these two things together, you are bound to get a minimum somewhere. So this particular addition of variance with squared bias is called typically called risk in statistics. And you try to minimize risk. This is in a nutshell uh, a broad description of many uh, non-parametric regression methods. Uh, yeah, so uh, the particular regression method, non-parametric regression method we used is called REACT, uh, stands for Risk Estimation and Coordinate Transformation. This was uh, put forth by, primarily by this person, Rudolf Bera 
from Berkeley, I think, and then picked up by Chris Genovis and Larry Wasserman, who I worked with. And uh, basically, it uses an orthogonal expansion to represent the unknown regression function, and the coefficients in this expansion are multiplied by another factor, and this factor is uh, successively damped closer to zero for higher and higher uh, terms in the orthogonal expansion. So this particular process is called shrinkage. Anyway, so this is something like um, uh, e e e uh, electronics, for example, electronics adds noise to voice data, for example. Now typically we expect that uh, noise is at higher frequencies and the signal part, which is the speech part, which is, is relatively at lower frequencies. So you, you, you systematically damp high frequencies retaining the right portion of the lower uh, signal part. So this met method uh, does that. It also comes up with a, I mean getting just the, get, giving out a prescription to get an optimal, optimally smooth fit is not enough because later on downstream people would want to ask all kinds of inference questions of, for example, I mean, in this context, uh, what can you say about this peak? Uh, how tall it can be and how short it can be? So the vertical uncertainty, how much can it wiggle horizontally? These questions are relevant to the cosmology context. So, uh, or another question would be, this is your optimal fit, but how much can it wiggle? Can you give me an envelope around this uh, fit, which, is supposed to contain the unknown dependence with some 95% probability. So uh, we talk about 95% confidence sets. So these kinds of questions are answered through a construct called a confidence set here. And schematically, okay, uh, in this particular method we are talking about let's say uh, 1000 data points. So we are talking about 1000 coefficients in the orthogonal expansion. So we are talking about a thousand dimensional space and uh, the confidence set is centered by construction at the optimal fit that we you obtain from the same method. And uh, the method gives you a prescription to calculate a radius around the fit which is supposed to contain the unknown truth with given level of uh, confidence or given probability. So, I mean, in reality one never knows where the truth is, but hopefully it is close to this thing. Uh, the idea is if you are working at 67% confidence, then uh, the, the, the radius that you get from using this method uh, gives you a region, a spherical region, and every point in this region is a potential candidate for the unknown truth. That's how one interprets this thing. So this interpretation is important, you will see overtones of this interpretation all through uh, when I show the results. So the, the thing is, this is just a schematic, you are talking about a high dimensional spherical object. Every point in that object represents one particular spectral variation. And uh, in principle, if you want to find uncertainties in uh, peak locations, peak heights, such things, then essentially whichever level of confidence you are working at, scan that confidence set adequately with uniform uh, coverage and uh, record the variation in the quantity of your interest and minimum and maximum of those variations will give you a confidence interval or confidence set on that quantity. This is the operating logic of this particular method. And this confidence set construct is what really makes it uh, useful in this context. Okay, so uh, this WMAP satellite uh, went up, I think, in 2001, right? Okay, uh, 2000 or 2001, about that. The first data realization, uh, I think, came in uh, 2002 or 2003. Uh, and thereafter, every two years, it <coughs> kept spitting out uh, newer data realizations, which were uh, more and more precise because it was observing same patches of sky multiple times. Uh, so with the first year, first release of WMAP, uh, this thing, so this is the first year release actually. 
this is the data I showed you earlier and this is the react fit for that data. This is for the third year data. You can see that between first year and third year data, the second peak seems to get a better uh, uh, enhancement and second peak seems to be getting resolved better. Now, uh, the, the spectrum looks very flat. The, the reason is that the vertical axis is uh, um, same across all these pictures. So it's uh, tuned to the largest possible variation. So successive pictures will look uh, flatter and flatter. So this is for the third year uh, WMAP data. This is for the fifth year data. Uh, this is for the seventh year data. Between five and seven, this uh, multiple range got covered. And evidently at the largest multiple and the uncertainties were still larger. WMAP people uh, gave out one more data realization, the nine year data set. We did not work on that, so I don't have results for that. Uh, talking about uncertainties, here is a bunch of interesting uh, plots. As I said, uh, we are talking about this confidence set construct and every point in this confidence set represents one spectrum which you can compute, that's not the issue. Uh, just look at, the, uh, take, take it at the conceptual level, how to do it is a separate matter. Uh, so, I mean, we were working at 95% level, so in principle, you scan every point inside this 95% uh, confidence set, in principle, in practice, you sample it adequately or to the limit of your computational power. And, um, for each spectrum that you pull out from the confidence set, record the uh, peak location, peak height, and across all these random samples, uh, randomly sampled spectra, you take the largest and smallest variation, and that gives you the. Uh, <coughs> but uh, along with that, what we have done in this plot is to actually plot the peak location and peak height in the form of these scanners. So, so, yeah, so so. Uh, this dip is important for a different reason, I, I won't go into that. So the first peak is pretty well constrained. It doesn't wiggle too far horizontally or vertically. Uh, second dip and second peak seem to overlap uh, somewhat. With uh, third dip and third peak, things are far more uncertain at this end. So to conclude that there are more than, there is more than one peak just based on this data, would seem a little far-fetched, but then things do get better with uh, better data. This is for the third year. So clearly here the first peak and the second peak almost got resolved pretty well. With fifth uh, year data, things got even better. With seventh year data, things got better for the uh, low multiple peaks, but uh, clearly things are not so good here. Um, in the end, of course, the, the WMAP mission was later on succeeded by a, a mission called Planck uh, by the European Space Agency and Planck did a far better job on this thing. I'll show, show you a, a picture later on. Okay, uh, here is a piece of uh, related to the science which, is, which comes out naturally from this analysis. Um, we took two models. One is the mainstream Lambda CDM model. Uh, and the other one contained a small fraction of neutrinos in it. I, I won't be able to explain the details, but astronomers in the audience can explain this thing. Uh, the point is, what is what we found interesting is the fits that you get by assuming lambda CDM and the hot neutrino lambda CDM H lambda CDM model. These fits from the viewpoint of this non-parametric confidence set are not that different because they are about the same distance from the uh, non-parametric fit. So this is 0.154, this is 0.149, hardly much difference. But then across data realizations, you see that this sort of goes down. So the lambda CDM parametric fit is getting closer to the non-parametric fit for that realization. And more dramatically, this hot lambda CDM fits, they are successively being pushed out.
very dramatically. So this is uh, clearly showing that Lambda CDM using these four realizations of WMAP data, that Lambda CDM clearly is the right model to uh, model the universe. So uh, the, the, the point of this thing is that uh, this methodology does allow doing that, it does allow asking these kinds of questions and it, it allows you to answer them. Uh, okay, this, yeah, it's quick. Here is a, a, a plot I need to explain what it is. And uh, our collaborator Tarun was mighty excited by this plot because this uh, plot shows the harmonicity of the acoustic oscillations. Let me explain what it is. If you take a spectrum like this thing and record variations in the peaks, so consider this scatter, and uh, you then record the uh, location of the first peak, location of the second peak, imagine it as a point in a two-dimensional space. Similarly, you do it for first peak versus third peak, first peak versus fourth peak, so on and so forth, second versus third. Now, if these are harmonic, uh, uh, I mean oscillatory in a uh, somewhat simple sense, then one would expect that if you look at peak-peak correlations, they would form a regular rectangular kind of lattice. And that is actually what comes out of uh, this analysis that you, you, you uh, record the variations in uh, your uh, spectra in the confidence set, look at where uh, let's say the first and the second peak are located and look at the scatter of first and first peak versus second peak. That forms this particular blob here for the first peak and this, is, this has to be third peak, okay. The second peak was, okay. Okay. Um, okay. First and third, yeah. So the labels are a bit missed. So you see, you see that you see this kind of rectangular arrangement. And um, I, I have a plot for the Planck uh, data, which is far better, up to six peaks, and it shows a really nice rectangular rangoli kind of arrangement uh, but that, that plot somehow is much uh, heavier on uh, file size so I didn't include it here. So uh, this is basically illustrating the fundamental physics of acoustic oscillations of the primordial uh, universe and the harmonicity of these oscillations. That's how we interpreted it. Varun was mighty excited about this thing. Along this line uh, I think Professor Mankavi uh, made, made a comment earlier about the nature of data and uh, theory and inference. Okay, what I am tempted to comment is, in this case we know that the physics, based on whatever physics we understand, we know that the physics is <coughs> harmonic acoustic oscillations. Now the data does, the, the, the combination of this data and this method does seem to confirm it. Suppose the theory was not as advanced as it is. Suppose we did not know as much physics. And if we saw this plot, what would we conclude? Would we be able to reconstruct the whole acoustic physics based on that? I don't know. So a related question a bit uh, posed in a flashy fashion is, uh, Johannes Kepler had the advantage of Tycho Brahe's extensive data and his own data. Had he been trained in modern statistical methods, would he have been able to infer the three laws of planetary motion? I don't know, honestly. So this is that kind of question. So this go, goes into the uh, interrelationships between science and statistics or methodology and, and science in general. Uh, I don't know if there are any answers to these kind of questions. Okay, to wind up this uh, part, the Planck satellite uh, had, had a much better resolution and so on. So later on all this thing was superseded by Planck and uh, the, the data, Planck data are so precise that uh, almost, uh, I mean lots of, a large number of peaks and dips are really well resolved. In addition, Planck also uh, gathered a lot more information about polarization and so on and that's why uh, the people are working on that. So I will conclude this part here. Uh, 
if you feel like asking any question, something is unclear, please do stop me in, in the middle. I'll move on to the next part. Uh, how much time do you have? Uh, 45 minutes are over. Okay. Uh, I can, okay, then I can do a quick, uh, this thing is 5 minutes. Okay, let's skip the second part, I'll just move on to the... Okay, here is a uh, situation, is, here is a small problem which we, I did with Deepajan Mitra at NCRA and I, uh, all my NCRA colleagues have heard this thing before so I am sorry about this thing. Um, so this is about making pulsar observations and uh, so, so Yashwan talked about JMRT uh, earlier, JMRT he also showed this picture so there are 30 antennas and uh, for pulsar observations, they point antennas to the same pulsar, all antennas to the same pulsar and record the signal and uh, each antenna observes the same signal separately and after correcting for time delays, geometric delays and so on, signals are added together and the reason for adding signals together is that, uh, you know, with adding signals together, you hope to enhance the signal to noise ratio. It's a very plain one of one square root n kind of dependence. But then uh, the data rates are high and uh, individual signals from individual antennas can't be stored for posterity and you can't make a decision that I want to drop this antenna and retain that antenna. Uh, after making observations it has to be done on the fly. Uh, so you need an upfront decision. Usually astronomers add all the signals together uh, just to, you know, hoping that uh, things go well. Uh, the questions we tried to address was, can we identify bad antennas in an agnostic fashion? Because if you can do it agnostically, you can automate it and build into the pipeline, hopefully. Can we rank antennas by some kind of measure of quality? And the third question was most important, adding all antennas, all antenna streams together, does it really help? And how does one make an upfront decision of including which antennas and leaving out which ones? So the particular data set we worked on consisted of 31 antennas. One uh, particular data set came from VLA, not from GMRT. It was just included for fun. Um, what, what is done is uh, to assess the quality of an antenna stream, uh, before making a pulsar observation, pulsars are relatively uh, weak sources of radio emission, uh, but then there are other sources of radio emission which are much stronger. So you, you point your antenna at a blank region of sky without much emission, then move the antenna to the strong source and move it back. So you expect that you will have a low signal when you are in the off region, high signal when in the on region and low signal again will move it back. So you, you expect a hat kind of profile here. This is how part of the data looks like. Uh, these are even numbered and data sets, although I can call them antennas, they, they need not necessarily be one to one with JMRT nomenclature. So you, you can see that you know the vertical scales are can be very different across different antennas. In particular look at this uh, this this data set, this one and this one. Um, there, there clearly seems to be something wrong because they don't look like the hat, this thing. Now for this particular problem, it's not important, the, the vertical magnitude is not that important, so we decided to uh, uh, scale it, bring it in the range 0 to 1, so all signals are comparable in some sense, and then these three bad antennas, which vis visually, they uh, clearly show up as something wrong with the, uh, with the antennas. Uh, yeah, so you can see these kinds of trends here, you can see certain shifts here like here. Uh, there can be outliers like maybe this one. So these are all kinds of confounds that uh, interfere with your uh, decision making process. So about the first question, in this, in this particular case it turned out that if you simply make box plots of all these signals ignoring the uh, horizontal axis, then clearly this one, the, the medi if you just look at the medians, then uh, uh, these two 
and this one look very different from the rest of them. So you can clearly identify uh, these three identi uh, antennas without doing much of fancy statistics here. If you want to design a measure of quality, uh, an obvious choice is the on-source signal minus the off-source signal divided by the off-source noise level. This uh, is a measure of, you could define the signal to noise ratio. Technically it's a contrast to noise because you are subtracting two things together. So anyway, uh, so this could be one measure of quality. The other measure of quality that we talked about, okay, talk about it in, in a uh, minute. Now, the, the, it turned out that uh, estimating the numerator and the denominator correctly was the key to good results. So, uh, for the numerator, it was the difference in the medians which uh, turned out to be a good way of doing it, not the difference in the means, because means are susceptible to outliers, medians are robust against outliers. And measuring the or estimating the denominator, it turned out that the usual sample uh, standard deviation estimator was a bad choice uh, uh, because of, specifically because of uh, these kinds of unpredictable trends in the data. So, a natural choice in this case was an estimator called the Rice estimator for variance, where you take the difference between successive y values. So, any trend in the data is automatically taken out at, at some level at least. So this turned out to be a much better estimator. The other measure of quality we thought about was deviation from this ideal hat kind of shape. And th then, then you could uh, take the distance between, distance in any sense of the word, between the ideal profile versus uh, the actual data and uh, uh, inverse of that so that this response quality factor is high when the distance is low and vice versa. Now, if you plot the uh, antennas on this uh, signal to noise ratio versus response quality factor plane, then you can clearly rank them. The best ones uh, show up at the top right end and the uh, uh, bad ones show up at the bottom right end. Uh, does adding all antennas uh, together, does it really help? So, uh, what we did was to take uh, groups of, I, I mean, fix the size of a group, antenna group, and take all, all possible combinations of that group size. So, if you choose a size of 5 antennas, uh, size of the group as 5, then you have 30 C5 uh, possible ways of choosing 5 antennas out of 30. So, across these 30 C5 combinations, you measure the signal to noise ratio, and uh, you calculate the group uh, SNR for that. There is a way of doing it. Now, what we expect is that, this group SNR will grow as a square root of the group size. Uh, and in this case, since we are talking about only 30 antennas, uh, it is possible to do a full combinatorial search, brute force full combinatorial uh, uh, computing here. So, if you do that, this is what you, this is what one sees. So, so the SNRs calculated for different groups for a given antenna group size you see this uh, square root of uh, group size uh, dependence broadly, but then there is a lot of variation. And the maximum possible SNR shows up somewhere around this 20 antennas for at this particular point in time, whenever the data was uh, collected. So, so, so identifying this particular antenna group would be the task. And whether it corresponds to the top so many antennas coming from this thing that we, we didn't really check that should have been done because that then this would have given you the actual uh, uh, indices of antennas which should have, should be added. So this is uh, this is basically uh, I, would, I would stop here. Thank you. various case studies uh, that show how statistical methods can be used to deduct data and seek answers. Uh, I will now call upon Harsha to uh, honor Mr. Mehta.